Hi there, I'm going to try a video on enthalpy changes and uh, energy diagrams. And in doing this one, it's not going to be a tutorial where I work out calculations like most of them that I've done. It's just going to be an explanation of some of the theory. And it's not going to be exact and correct in a lot of ways, but it's going to help you to understand what's going on in energy diagrams. That's my hope. So we start off with the question I have on here. It says, what causes some reactions to be endothermic and others to be exothermic? Now, um, endothermic, if you remember, is a reaction that requires heat. Heat goes into the reaction as it happens. And exothermic, uh, exo meaning like exit, that's where heat is leaving the reaction. Now, what causes that to happen? Well, first we have to look kind of what's going on during a reaction. Now, what's happening during a reaction is bonds are being broken. And as the old bonds are breaking, the potential energy, the, there's energy stored in those bonds. And so when you break the bonds, the energy of the system would go up. And new bonds form. Now, depending on what bonds form, depends on how the energy will rise or fall. So if we just looked at an example here where we have sodium chloride, NaCl, and K2CO3, potassium carbonate. Now, if you had those and we would predict your products, then you should be thinking that you've got a double displacement reaction. And so if it's double displacement, what happens is these are ionic compounds, so your sodium and your potassium will switch spots. So sodium goes and attaches to carbonate, which is a minus two, and the potassium would go and attach to chloride. So you would have a sodium, which is plus one, and a carbonate, minus two, get together, so you get two sodiums, and a potassium goes with chloride, plus one, minus one. So they're happy. So these guys are your products, and these are the reactants that go together. But if we get down and kind of draw a representation of what's happening by looking at the picture here, here I have a sodium chloride molecule and a KCO3 molecule. Oh wait, we have the back, we didn't balance this stuff. Okay, so here, our reaction's unbalanced. We have two sodiums, so we need to put a two in and have two sodium chloride molecules. This way we have two chlorides now, two chlorides here. So we need two chlorides on that side, like 32. Now we have two potassiums on the right. There's already two potassiums on the left. So that makes the equation balanced. So it turns out we need two sodium chlorides. So two of these guys we're going to need. And that, there's two sodium chlorides in the line between them. And one potassium carbonate. OK, so of these two sodium chlorides that get together, what happens is when they're reacting, the bonds break, and as we break this NaCl, that bond between the NaCl, and the ionic bonds between K and CO3, as all those bonds break now, you've got a whole bunch of energy that's ready to be used. But new bonds form. And according to what I see here, I need to take a carbonate, and it needs to link up with two sodiums. So we have sodium here, sodium here and a new bond forms between the sodiums and the carbonates. Now what also forms is we get two molecules of KCl, which means one of these potassiums and a chlorine get together with a bond, and another potassium and chlorine get together with a bond. Okay? But those bonds didn't just get broken by themselves. What happened was those molecules had to go in and strike, and strike hard enough, and with the right orientation, means they had to be lined up the right way, to make the bonds break. So there was a certain energy required, but once it happens, we've rearranged all of our molecules. So if I go back as quick as I can here. So what we have is this molecule, sodium chloride, had to come in and strike and beat against this in a certain way. Now maybe the alignment had to be up like this and get and cause that to resonate. Maybe this had to come and strike in the right spot and just hit the bond to keep passing the carbonate. So whatever happens to make the bond break, it has to come in the right way. And that's why it takes some extra energy sometimes to do that. That's why there's an activation energy involved in the, in the uh, molecule. And we'll get back to that in just a second. So if we look what we just produced, we had some reactants. And when we broke the bonds, the energy rose up to break bonds. And then when new bonds form, the energy decreases. And so from the energy it reactants to products, you have a drop in this case. But it could be that when you break the bonds, the arrangement 
afterwards, and here you have all your bonds beforehand, afterwards the bonds could have actually more energy than we started with, which means you would have had to heat the reaction up to make that happen. It would climb up as you heat the reaction, and the new energy when you form the new bonds would be higher than what you started with. That would represent a reaction where you had to put heat in. This would be an endothermic reaction, meaning it required heat to make it happen. Meaning the heat afterwards in your products is more, sorry, the total potential energy afterwards is higher than the potential energy before. Meaning it required energy to make it happen, so it would have absorbed heat from the surroundings when it happens. The one up here, the beginning conditions had more energy than the end conditions, so the excess energy of that drop right here of energy would be released as heat in the environment, the water usually in a, in a solution, whatever the environment is, would actually absorb that energy. So if I go back, I'll go over here and look at a common energy curve. What you have going on is your potential energy over time. We have our reagents, these are the reactants that we have, and then you heat it up so there's a certain amount of energy. It doesn't just drop and go straight down to the products. It has to be because the molecules have to hit in the right way that there's all of these collisions happening and it's heated up. So it takes a while to get to the point. And up here is where all those bonds were broken in the transition state. It's right at the point where all the bonds are about to break and it's about to take off. So once all the bonds are broken, then the reaction smoothly goes down and hits. This height above the original energy, the height that you have of this peak is how much energy it takes for the reaction to happen. We call that the activation energy, the energy it takes to make the reaction happen. And then you get the energy of the products down here. So we say now that the difference between the energy you start with and the energy you end at is your heat of reaction. It's how much energy of reaction. The heat of reaction. That's our enthalpy delta H. Okay. Now, what type of uh, what type of reaction you have again is whether the products are lower than where you started, or if the products were higher than you started, then you're, you would have had to put energy into the reaction. These guys would be a positive delta H, an increase in energy. These here are a negative delta H. It doesn't drop in energy. Now, what a catalyst is, which is a common question that you get, what a catalyst is, you may look up in a book and you find out that a catalyst is something that speeds up a reaction or makes a reaction happen easier. Well, a catalyst on an energy diagram, if it makes a reaction happen easier, then it's something that would allow the reaction to go without having to reach the same transition state or the same activation energy. It would lower the amount of energy that's needed so that maybe the, the reaction only has to hit this height and then it can proceed onto the products. A catalyst makes the, react, makes the activation energy less. Instead of the activation energy being that difference, it's actually a lower peak that's needed. When the catalyst is added, the amount of energy needed is less and that makes the reaction happen easier, which would hence make it happen faster. It doesn't affect delta H at all. The catalyst doesn't change the difference between the reactants and products. They still have the same energy before, same energy after. The catalyst does nothing to that. What the catalyst does, however, is lower the activation energy and still makes the reactions happen quicker. So if I try to look, if we were trying to sum up with our energy diagrams, exothermic reactions should be reactions where you've given heat to the environment, where you've gone from high to low. This is exothermic, A. And exothermic is again where it drops, B. Go from high to low. Endothermic reactions are reactions where you go from a low to high, so that's C and D are endothermic. Hopefully the last, which of these reactions would be fast or slow? The ones with the highest activation energies are the slow reactions because it's harder to get to them. C would be a slow reaction. A would be a slow reaction. Fast reactions would be A and B because they have less, or sorry, B and D, excuse me. B has a smaller hump and D has a smaller hump to overcome, and so they have smaller energies. 
hope that helps, guys.